morning. I want to welcome you all to what we hope will be a fabulous event for the next two days, our conference, the Court of Public Opinion, the Practice and Ethics of Trying Cases in the Media. I'm Kathy Bradley, a professor here and a, the chair of the conference steering committee. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to introduce the conference and introduce some of the people that, that have been key in getting this thing um, organized. Eighteen months ago, this university and this community were rocked by unfounded allegations of sexual assault by members of our men's lacrosse team. At this, as the story opened, we had no idea where it was going, and conversations began and uh, commentary began um, from a wide range of voices. We watched as this story moved from being a local story to something that took the national spotlight, and we've watched as it's continued to move over the last year and a half. But nine months ago, another conversation began, and that one started within these walls when a number of faculty decided that we needed to look beyond the lacrosse case to think about what were the bigger issues about cases that get tried in the media. What happens when a set of facts leads to a case that captures the attention of the media and the public, that takes center stage, and what happens in terms of how we balance our First Amendment rights of free speech and free press against our constitutional rights of safeguarding the rights of the accused and the reputational interests of everyone who is involved. And it's that conversation that we hope to have over the next two days. So while we wouldn't be here without the lacrosse case, we certainly hope that we're looking way beyond it um, at, in the conversation that we're beginning here. Um, we are very, very grateful to a number of people and a number of groups that have made this possible. First, this conference is really the brainchild of a number of faculty who began conversations last winter, including Paul Hagen, Chris Schrader, Jim Salzman, and others, who then invited a number of other faculty members into the discussion and led to the formation of the conference steering committee that I chair. Other members of the committee are Professor Sarah Beal, Jim Salzman, Paul Hagen, and Tom Metzloff, and they've all worked very, very hard to make this happen. We've also had tremendous support from the law school, both from our former dean, Kate Bartlett, and from our new dean, uh, David Levy, who have supported this conference in every way possible, very enthusiastically, and given us all kinds of help in getting this organized. We've also had on-the-ground administrative support from a host of people within the law school who've made this happen, um, and who've done the, the, the publications, who've done the organization, and who are making this uh, work um, today. Um, we've also had uh, tremendous help from students, and we're particularly grateful to Law and Contemporary Problems, our interdisciplinary journal, which is um, helping to sponsor this conference, and we'll be publishing papers from the conference in an issue to be published next fall. Students are here helping us today with administrative uh, staff support, and we're very, very grateful for all that they've done so far. Um, and uh, certainly um, not least, we are very, very thankful to the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. It was because of conversations that were begun with representatives of the Knight Foundation and, and Kate Bartlett last year that we were able to uh, seek and obtain a, a grant that's helped to fund this conference, um, that's made uh, the scope of the conference what it is. We've also been very, very um, grateful for the help we've gotten from them in terms of suggesting participants for the conference and the structure of the conference, and a number of the people that you're going to hear from over the next two days have um, connections to the Knight Foundation and are going to be able to, to represent that perspective as well. Um, and finally, I owe a, a tremendous debt of thanks to all of the people who've agreed to participate in the conference as our panelists. They come from a wide array of expertise. We have traditional media representatives, we have new media representatives, we have defense counsel, prosecutors, judges, um, academics, and representatives of the public, and all of them together are going to give us the interdisciplinary approach that we are hoping to, to enter into to this uh, today and tomorrow in a conversation um, that we hope will carry forward after this weekend. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to representatives from Law and Contemporary Problems to bring greetings from their journal. Good morning. I'm Sarah Hawkins. I'm the editor-in-chief of Law and Contemporary Problems. We are very excited to be a part of this conference, and we want to, at the outset, give some uh, appreciation to Professor Bradley. We would certainly not be here without her, uh, her assistant Nalon, Linda Tucker, and other staff members who have made this conference possible. 
Long Contemporary Problems looks forward to publishing the papers that are generated from this conference. We are Duke's oldest journal. We were founded in 1933. We're a legal but also an interdisciplinary journal, uh, and we publish four times a year. Because of the journal's very unique symposium format, we're able to comprehensively examine cutting edge legal and social issues and to publish leading authors in each field that we study. We hope that you'll enjoy these panels and then later visit Long Contemporary Problems website to see the final papers. And we hope you'll consider citing Long Contemporary Problems and the papers that we generate in your own work. <laughs> and finally, I want to highlight some special work that's been done on our end. Erin Wren, if you don't mind, just give me a little wave. She's our special projects editor and she has been our point person on the Long Contemporary Problems side. We owe her a huge debt of gratitude and she's our resident expert. So if you have questions about the papers or anything going on this weekend, let her know, but also, uh, give her an extra smile and pat on the back as we go through this weekend. So we, we thank you for being here. We're very excited to hear the panelists and to read their papers later on. And uh, we wish you all the best as this weekend proceeds. Thanks. <coughs> Good morning. I'm David Levy. I'm the new dean at the Duke Law School. Welcome to Duke Law School. Welcome to this conference on the court of public opinion. To a degree that we take for granted, the effectiveness of our courts and justice system depends upon public confidence and acceptance. Victims forego private vengeance. Defendants show up for trial. Witnesses come forward to give evidence, and jurors agree to serve, all on the belief that the system will operate fairly and with dignity. Yet so often in the high profile case, at the very moment when public understanding and confidence might be enhanced, the opposite seems to, to occur. The legal system may seem neither fair nor dignified, when subjected to intense media scrutiny, fueled by the media's own internal dynamic and entertainment goals. In this conference, we will examine the problems presented by the high profile case. And we will do so in the best traditions of this university, with vigor and with respect. It is a pleasure to thank the conference planners, particularly uh, Professor Bradley, to organize this wonderful conference, and the Knight Foundation, represented this morning by Eduardo Hauser. Mr. Hauser is our alumnus, and he is a distinguished one. He holds an LLM from this law school, and he's a member of our Board of Visitors. He is a native of Caracas, Venezuela. He is the founder of Daily Me, a news service that provides personalized media content from thousands of sources. He was Vice President of AOL Latin America, he was managing director of the Cisneros Group of Companies and vice president of news and information for Cisneros's Venevision, the world's second largest producer of Spanish language programming. He serves on the board of directors of National Public Radio and on the advisory board of the Knight Foundation. Mr. Hauser. Uh, well, thanks so much, and uh, good morning to you all. Thank you, David. Um, I, am, I am really delighted to be here, um, and I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Knight Foundation. Uh, this conference is, um, is a very important event for us. Let me spend a few moments talking about the Knight Foundation. Um, the Knight Foundation was started about 67 years ago, and it was started by uh, John and James Knight, who were also the founders of Knight Ritter. And Knight Ritter, the chain of newspapers, became uh, the first funder of the Knight Foundation. And ultimately, over time, it became self-funded. It is now one of the a largest provider of funds and support for free speech and journalism. The Knight Foundation operates primarily two programs. The first program is the Communities Program. And the Communities Program was developed in order to support financially and otherwise the 26 communities where the Knight Brothers uh, had newspapers. The second program um, is the uh, Journalism Initiatives Program. And the Journalism Program was started in the 1950s and to this date has uh, funded $300 million in programs that support free speech and promote the advancement of journalism at home and abroad. Um, 
when this idea came, came together, obviously this program was very meaningful to us from two perspectives because it, it will help us understand better journalism um, in the context of a high profile case, but also because it'll help us understand the deep impact that a conflict like the Duke lacrosse event had in a community such as uh, Duke and Durham. Um, to me personally, the event is very important. Number one, because it involves this law school where I came as an international student and graduated in 1993. Uh, number two, because it has the support of the Knight Foundation, and I cannot think of a better program to support than this one here. Uh, number three, because as a member of NPR, naturally I am very interested in everything involving media and the public interest. And number four, because to a certain degree, I was an accomplice of Kate Bartlett in getting the funding for this conference uh, to get started. So in some ways, I guess the uh, message to David is come to Miami often because good things happen there. <laughs> um, but um, actually, just to spend a few moments how it got started, Kate came to Miami to an event that I hosted for her. And Alberto Ibarguen, the CEO of Knight, who will join us uh, later today, and is himself a very proud Penn Law graduate, was immediately attracted to the idea of holding this conference. Um, this conference could have taken place uh, anywhere, but having it at Duke has very special meaning and gives it a very special uh, level of projection. Now, if this uh, event is important to me, uh, I can only imagine what it means for our next speaker. So let me spend a few moments uh, talking about Hawden Carter. Uh, over the years, I have found that there's two kinds of people that are very hard to introduce. Those that no one knows, and those that everybody knows. Well, such is the case of uh, Hawden Carter indeed. Um, Rather than an introduction, because he really doesn't need one, and much less from me, I'd like to talk uh, about his accomplishment and recognize Harding as a... Uh, is, is Harding here yet? I, well, I, I hope you'll um, hear the recording after, so I can get some credit <laughs> for that. But I, I, I'll keep going in case uh, Harding joins us momentarily. <laughs> um, Harding Carter is a journalist, um, an academic, Oh, Kathy, I'm, should I, is Harding around? He's, we haven't seen him yet. Not as of yet. Should we pause for a few moments until he pause arrives? Pause for a couple minutes until well, we have a couple of yeah. Okay. Good luck. Okay, folks. Um, if I could uh, ask you to take your seats again, our keynote speakers here. So I will <laughs> resume the accolades. Uh, we, we will run from the beginning. Fast. It's okay, sir. So we, we have two options, Hatting. We could have um, introduced you and then waited, but right. I thought we'd get some credit for saying all the good things um, that I'm going <laughs> to say now. <laughs> Um, and I'll just resume almost uh, where I stopped. It's uh, Harding Carter doesn't need an introduction, so rather my, what I chose to do is uh, uh, do recognition of a, of a very distinguished career um, and possibly some aspects that may be familiar or not to you uh, about Harding. Uh, Harding is a man of many facets. Um, and, and before I forget to say so, bef um, he spent the last eight years before he moved to North Carolina being the president and CEO of the Knight Foundation. So. A lot of where we are and the success of the foundation is in large measure thanks to Harding. Um, I was saying that if this event was meaningful to me, I came to this law school, I work uh, at night, uh, I can only imagine what it means for you to be here with us. But on the spirit of um, no introductions needed, let me just um, talk a little bit about the different uh, facets of Harding. As an academic, uh, Harding has been for 15 years a trustee of Princeton University where he graduated summa cum laude. He was a tenured uh, Knight Professor of Public Affairs at the University of Maryland, and more recently accepted a professorship in leadership and public policy at our neighboring uh, UNC. Uh, Harding has so far received nine honorary degrees. Um, as a civic servant, uh, Harding served the presidential campaign of Jimmy Carter um, and also Lyndon Johnson. After Jimmy Carter's election, Harding was appointed Assistant Secretary of State and spokesman of the department. As a journalist, he had an amazing career, has an amazing career. As a print journalist alone, he won the National Professional Journalism so Society's Award for Editorial Writing and a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University. 
as a broadcast journalist. He worked with most major networks, and in such tenure, he won four Emmys and the Edward Murrow Award for Best Foreign Documentary. As an author, Carter has written two books and contributed to nine others. His philanthropic activities include current and past seats on the boards of the Century Foundation, the Center for Public Integrity, the Enterprise Corporation of the Delta, the Foundation for the Mid-South, the Japan Society, the American Committee on U.S.-Soviet Relations, the George Marshall Foundation, the American Council of Young Political Leaders, the Atlantic Council, among others. In the 80s, uh, Harding um, said the following words, and I quote, television news is like a lightning flash. It makes a loud noise, lights up everything around it, leaves everything else in the darkness, and then is suddenly gone. So I cannot imagine anyone better to address us this morning than Harding Carter to cover um, the impact uh, of high profile cases in the law. So please join me with a round of applause to welcome Harding Carter. Thank you very much. You may remember that particular little quote as I go along here. Bye, and I'll be gone. This uh, conference uh, is obviously a derivative from events which I'm not going to touch on very much uh, in the course of what I have to say. I expect that over the next two days, many of you are going to be coming in with learned or passionate or just absolutely disingenuous or demagogic <laughs> attempts to put it in perspective. I'm going to touch it, but not otherwise go with it. Let me begin with the obvious that those of you who are gathered here do include a great deal of expertise. Uh, many of you I've been on the same side with uh, in some battles which uh, closely resemble some which arose from here. Some of you, as I see from the program, even if I don't see you in here right this minute, I've been on the other side from in some of those battles. All of you uh, are going to be offering each other a wide variety of perspectives, and I only well, I'm sorry that I can't be here for the entire thing. I offer this somewhat shameless flattery of all of you for this reason. It frees me to do what I do best, which is to flail around with some irresponsible abandon uh, as a personal journalist uh, on subjects which are, I think, of some real passionate moment. Preface number one over. Preface number two. I really am not, not, not going to give you final answers on the Nifong nastiness. Uh, that is for others. But let's think of what follows now as roughly a conversation around a kitchen table, a monologue rambling in times, attempting to deal with the kind of stuff that journalists and sometimes, if we're all lucky, lawyers talk to each other about in this area. Let's take what I say as the musings of a person who has been in and out of journalism all my life, who grew up as the son of an editor and publisher, who was in the business, and, and to this day, think of it as the best old place of all, as we sing of Princeton and I think of journalism. And I say that with real conviction. But take it also as a reflection of a man who has spent a fair amount of his adult life essentially trying to get the press to come to grips with its own failings, with our own failings, with the ways in which we go beyond the descriptions of fairness or accuracy or responsibility. A word, let me say right now, I would not entrust to any agency of government to define. Responsibility is not merely in the eye of the holder. If you think for a moment of what this government in which we today live believes press responsibility would mean, I trust you would join me in saying, God save us from such a definition from such a government when it comes to press performance. And yet, and yet, I can say that the press in often arrogant, arrogant refusal 
to admit that it has responsibilities, however defined, has regularly rejected over the years any number of proposals and offerings which would have at least, if nothing else, given the appearance of being an institution which understood that what it did had real effects upon real people, often with negative consequences, and that it would not be a bad thing if from time to time there was an accounting. I say that as somebody who was on the original commission which came up with the idea of a national news council, a news council which was throttled in its crib by the high poobahs of American journalism who proclaimed it the surest step toward government regulation they'd ever seen, blah, 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 blah. And therefore, an institution which would have allowed citizens to bring complaints about performance and accuracy and fairness to a non-judicial hearing, subject only to the requirement that its findings be published, that institutional response to press irresponsibility was not merely throttled, machine gunned, poisoned, stomped on, killed, and died some years later, a pallid imitation of what it should have been. And quite frankly, to this moment, I remain infuriated by that death and by that stupidity on the part of the press. As we watch that unlikely poster girl for press virtue, Judy Miller, go off to jail, as we watch the British unfortunate creep uh, go off to jail again for doing such things as might safely have been better handled by being brought short by the press speaking truth to its own dishonor, I am reminded again that each time at each ratchet of the screw that the press refuses to face up to its responsibility to police itself, about which more or later we come closer to the day in which Judy Miller is not the occasional example, but is increasingly the norm of a press which refuses ever to acknowledge that something else exists besides one phrase in the First Amendment. Now, let me frame nonetheless what I want to say with a couple of quotes. One is a paraphrase of that old civil rights crazy, eventual convict, Rap Brown. Trial by media is as American as apple pie. Rap, of course, said correctly, violence is as American as apple pie. But trial by media is as American as apple pie. The other has to be drawn by inference from one line in the Dean's four paragraph word from David Levy in the announcement brochure. It went eventually, thanks to the actions of the North Carolina Attorney General and the extraordinary intervention of the North Carolina State Bar. The three young men were declared innocent and the prosecutor was disbarred. On those two notions hang most of what follows. Trial by media is as American as apple pie. This is not to excuse or rationalize, but simply to acknowledge. We are, of course, not geese arising in a new world every day. We cannot be as one with Claude Rains arriving in Humphrey Bogart's saloon to say that he was shocked, shocked, <laughs> shocked to discover that there was gambling there. But neither am I adopting the role of the aging cynic Take, like all of us in the self-deluded world of punditry, I prefer the label of clear-eyed analyst. So here, a few notions of analysis. Thesis one, whenever an unscrupulous prosecutor or cop or FB agent or high government official or politicians decides to mount the hunt, great packs of the media, traditional and new, will bay on cue. Second, journalists often proceed to outrun the pack itself, the huntmaster and all else, in a tumbling free-for-all marked by excesses more often associated with drunkenness than the rule of law. 
And then the hunt over, the quarry brought to ground and torn apart, there ensues with predictable regularity the hangover of belated remorse and shamefaced admissions of guilt. Conferences like this abound. We have vows of repentance filling the air, the airwaves and editorial pages from the New York Times to you name it, such has been the case with Duke's shameful cause celeb. And the repentance will last until the next time the horn sounds the hunt. When I hear and see it, I'm reminded of President Clinton's famous day in which at the dedication of the Holocaust Museum, weeping, he pledged never again, even as on that same day, he was turning down the request for American military forces to prevent, prevent the Holocaust in Rwanda. We are regularly indulging ourselves in the hypocrisy of repentance and the repetition of error. And then, what else? Perhaps because I was born not long before the media lynching of that undoubted convict, I mean undoubted kidnapper, Bruno Hopman, who if he had been innocent, could never have been given a fair trial. Perhaps because I grew up in the shadow of a region marked for long by the lynch murder of Leo Frank. Perhaps because you could not take American history in my day and not know of the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti, again, without reference to their guilt or innocence, most certainly lynched by media long before they were tried in a court which lynched them a second time in ways which give due process a bad name. Try them after you convict them was the principle, and it happened again and again. Looking at an old friend of mine who was at Emory for some time and thinking of the Frank case, I'm reminded of just how low newspapers can stoop. But let me go a little further. Perhaps because someone in the South of my time and place, and for decades before, not only in that South, but in most of the country, I am more than a little aware that the usual victims of media as well as literal lynching were persons of color, black men most often accused of crimes against whites. The commentary accompanying the call to this conference suggested that such is perhaps not the case today, that today the usual targets of media lynching are the famous, the athletic, the outstanding, the notorious, the rich, perhaps. Perhaps. That was not the rule in the time and place of which I speak, which was only yesterday, and in some places, of course, it is not even yet distant. There were precious few conferences arising from those travesties of justice, not in the communities in which they occurred, God knows, certainly not in the press associations of the various southern states, certainly not by bar associations whose members were as racist as any Ku Kluxer, indeed, some of whom were Ku Kluxers, and who were as inflamed by the grotesque stories of black rapine as any Ku Kluxer. Occasionally, a case would arise which was too much for at least some Southerners, the Scottsboro Boys being one such case, and it would get national and international attention on a hitherto unprecedented scale. But for the most part, what attention was paid mostly came in headlines such as one in the New Orleans paper about a hundred years ago, quote, Negro to be lynched in Baton Rouge today, and then cheered on the mob as it went off to view this fine example of justice. Even now, prosecutors too often get away with prejudicial murder, and newspapers too often blandly play the conveyor belt for their utterances in cases which are allegedly committed by the brown and the black and the poor against the white and the affluent. You should look it up. You should look around. But of course, some of these are hard to see because most of these cases are pleaded out long before trial. And you will not notice the consequences of what was the easy assumption of guilt 
the trial by release and then conviction on plea bargaining. America and a fair day in court. Now let me back up a minute. Wondrous things have happened in this country when it comes to this field. To say innocence projects is to say, my God, things can get better. To remember that the ACLU continues to be a thorn in the side of the powerful and a reminder that the rule of law is supposed to apply to the least and most obnoxious of these, our brethren, is a wonder to behold. And I must say that, again, looking around this room, there are people who toil tirelessly to try to bring to account and to allow journalists to understand how to account for fairness and ethics when it comes to their handling of trial by media, of accusation without proof. And I'm proud, I am seriously proud, that Knight Foundation, under that extraordinarily fine man who succeeded me, is paying for this conference. I'm proud of what Knight Foundation, long before I got there, and I trust long after I've been gone, will continue to do, which is to try to pay for the improvement of press performance in this and many other areas. We're not alone. There are others. The professors that I see here and the professionals I see here who care are not alone. There are others. But I cannot believe that one of us would deviate far from what I've had to say so far. Parenthetically, let me give you one of my uh, occasional asides on the Mike Nifong case. We should all be so lucky as to live in a country in which the kind of work done by the Raleigh News and Observer was the rule. I don't mean it was perfect at the beginning. Like everybody, it took credulously what it was that that out-of-control idiot put out. But having done so, faster than anyone except the Chronicle itself, faster than anybody else, and to read it was to watch a newspaper turn on a dime, it began to repeatedly say, this isn't straight. And it did it in a number of ways, editorially and news coverage. And again, I'm confident that some of you all are going to be dissecting it. I trust at least it's going to be a comparative analysis, putting it against the performance of others, some far better known in other parts of the country, as to how they managed to deal with the unfolding reality as opposed to the in initial assumption. Let's go back in time again. There was, of course, one famous moment in the 50s in which the press learned its lesson forever. <laughs> it was the McCarthy era in which we determined to our own satisfaction that never again would we allow assertion to outrun proof, that never again would we allow a demagogue to tell us about the loyalty or lack of it of others, their guilt or lack of it, without allowing them equal access and without following through in a strong and repertorial way on what was offered. Never again, we said. And here again, I trust we know the irony of that phrase. <sighs> now, we swore off and our oaths were sincere. And then we fell off the wagon. Which reminds me of that wonderful line, I'll paraphrase from that great, the greatest of all the editors of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley. He said, does the press lie? He said, of course we lie. Every time we print the lies of public officials. <laughs> and it's worth remembering. It is not that we do not know that government is not put in place to tell the truth. It is that we constantly, oh, I'm sorry, you know that line? <laughs> its business is to govern. It should not lie. But to expect it to tell the truth is to expect the sun to rise in the West. That is what we have an adversarial system for. And part of that is for the press to be sure that it accepts nothing credulously from any element of government at whatever level. 
To do so, of course, is to open the gates repeatedly. Okay, Hotting, knock off the old ancient history. That's all in the bad days. This is, after all, 50 years ago. What the hell? You're such an old guy. You think it's yesterday, but it's not. We are now so smart, and we are so educated, and we are so much better equipped to handle these problems that something like the Durham horror is only the occasional lapse. It is not representative of a larger problem. Yeah, oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Oh, baloney, baloney. Let us count the ways in which contemporary media have learned their lessons from the wretched excesses of that distant, more primitive time. No, let's not count. Let's just do some free association. Wen Ho Li. Anybody know his name? All right. Anybody know the name John Benet Ramsey? Anybody know Kobe Bryant? Anybody know Madeline Kate and Gary McCann? Anybody know Barry Bonds? Anybody remember the late Richard Jewell? Anybody remember Felix Block? Oh, he drives a bus here now. But Felix famously was accused of being a spy. I would assert right here that he was one. And a long time espionage guy for the KGB. It doesn't really matter because he was never charged, never brought to trial, and was the subject of a positively brilliant piece of work by ABC television in which you got to see him passing his briefcase to the KGB agent and exchanging briefcases and walking away in a grainy, wonderfully caught piece of fakery, never identified as fakery, a simulation of an event which was never proved and offered without saying that it was fakery as evidence of Mr. Block's guilt. That was not 50 years ago. Or perhaps uh, we may have forgotten, if not Richard Jewell then, that magnificent story of cover-up and greed, Whitewater, from which, after more headlines than the New York Times could produce on anything outside of an election, not one indictment and one conviction arising from the assertions which began with the so-called Whitewater scandal. And yet, you understand, we all know that there was massive fraud and cover-up there. We know it because while never proved in trial or even brought to trial, uh, we saw it repeated in the news of record. Guantanamo and its commander's media magnified assertion that those prisoners who committed suicide were, I quote, the worst of the worst of the world's terrorists. An assertion run as though it came from the lips of God in the press of the media of this country. I recommend a really useful movie, which is one that is not much liked in the business. You ought to be running on a loop right outside the door here, absence of malice. Look at it, those of you who have not seen it, and be reminded that even Hollywood can get some things right, and that in this case, they got it right. Is it demonstrable that we, that you of the press, have learned anything of lasting value, learned anything that inoculates us uniformly against the plague of irresponsibility? My wife and I have seven kids between us, one way or another, we were, we are, all media junkies. She, of course, saw reporters as the last best hope for change in the South and for change in the human rights conditions in the world in the various jobs she held. As I said, I grew up in the business and saw us all through rose-colored lens. Several of our adult children now in their 40s and 50s couldn't disagree more. One is a prosecutor in Brooklyn. One is a cop in Washington. One is a doctor here, a surgeon. And having had close contact with the media, as all three would have to, none emerges as champions of the intelligence, diligence, or fairness of its practitioners. They see us as lazy, poorly informed, easily led, sensationalist, and incapable of perspective or restraint. And these are the nicer things that they tell me. 
They are among the millions whom the polls say put newspaper and television trustworthiness barely above that of Congress, <laughs> a lowest of the low in these days. I uh, was getting my coffee the other day at my favorite Starbucks, 800 paces from my home, and I picked up, as I always do, just to look at it, though I'd already read part of it, the News and Observer of the Day, and on one of its less honorable days, its lead story was this wonderful which says, Trooper had sex in patrol car. Uh, it caught my attention. <laughs> and I asked, I asked the wonderful barista, I said to her, this sweet young woman, so what do you think of that? And she said, smiling, I try not to read the newspaper. It clouds my perception of reality. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, out of the mouths of almost anybody comes brilliance. But the, pop and the, but the cop and the prosecutor know something else as well, my kids. They know that the people on their side of the aisle bend the rules too much, that they are more intent on conviction than justice, that they are ruthless manipulators of the media. They forget, if they are, that they are officers of the court, and they aren't called to account enough. So here's my other point arising from the dean's very interesting phrase. We're at a conference about the media and the law, about free press and fair trial, about prosecutorial abuse and media frenzies, but I have long ago come to a conclusion based on, particip <laughs> based on participation with Lauren and others at more of these conferences on free press and fair trial than I can count. I've come to the conclusion uh, that you cannot look to the media for a solution, or if you do, don't hold your breath. In that proliferation which began after the reversal in the Shepard case and has sort of endured to this moment, uh, it always comes down to the lick log, as we would say, in which the bar looks earnestly at the press and says, now which restrictions are you willing to accept? And the press looks earnestly back at the bar and says, you must be kidding. I say that because, in fact, you can hold the media in contempt but under the understandings that have evolved in our country about the First Amendment, you cannot hold them legally accountable except in the most egregious of cases or in ways that do violence to what has evolved in this country from that long march away from Star Chamber justice. To quote that true cynic, H.L. Mencken, journalistic codes of ethics are all moonshine, or to put it another way, the average journalist's mind says that Hugo Black had it exactly right. What is it that you don't understand about shall make no law? What you don't understand about what the First Amendment says? But having said that point 18 times so far, let me say something else. That while my old partner Ron Goldfarb writing the New York University Law Review in 1961 noted that the price of freedom is a sanction of the vulgar as well as an outright press. Not so the bar, not so the courts, the prosecutors, the police. For them, there are clear rules. Clear rules, enforceable rules, canons, laws. No constitutional privilege stands between sanctions for these and what has occurred, for instance, here. Let me... Uh, try out a few quotations from a source familiar to this hometown audience, a Duke Law Journal article from 1967. The question of the guilt or innocence of an accused is a controversy to be decided not in the marketplace of ideas, but rather within the controlled conditions of a court of law. The fault must then be with the bar for failing to enforce its own canon and for violating its trusteeship over the legal system. Only this is later. Only if such a concerted effort fails should the bar unite in favor of compulsory restrictions on the press, for only then can the need for this be adequately ascertained. Only then. In other words, the real burden of making good on the promise of fair trials lies overwhelmingly on the bar, the agents of law, the agents of law and order, in all their garbs and on the courts demanding that the media behave as lawyers are supposed to behave is hopeless. 
demanding that cops, prosecutors, judges, and all other organs of justice behave as they are required to do by law and canon should be demanded and produced, which takes me back to the dean's line. The extraordinary intervention of the North Carolina State Bar. Why extraordinary? Why not routine? Why is it that that would be considered extraordinary to bring to curb a rogue prosecutor? Why is it not routine that the FBI agent carrying on a one-man vendetta against an unlikely target because they cannot find the right one should not be publicly identified, dismissed, and then left free to be hung by that man's lawyers? Why is it not routine, routine, that you would have state's attorneys general going after those who have violated the basic tenets of fairness in the prosecution of justice. What are canons for if not enforcement? Well, you all know the answer to that one, don't you? There's nothing quite so clubby as a bar, unless perhaps it's a press association meeting. <laughs> the idea of actually looking each other in the face and holding personally to account comes as loosely not to the bar as the average establishmentarian newspaper identifying by name and then systematically attacking another newspaper's coverage, which has brought discredit upon our profession. Seriously, I sometimes think that we would rather pee in the public than pee on each other in the establishment press. I know it is true of the bar. Extraordinary is precisely the right word, and extraordinary is precisely the word that has got to be abandoned when it comes to making good on those quite clear rules. You can amplify the list, and I'm now going to get on with it. The real lesson of the Nifong Horror Show is that there are tools aplenty to curb the hunt, to stop the publicity trumpet, to strip it from an unscrupulous prosecutor's hands. What I would hope, of course, is that establishmentarian lawyers would offer as much heavy lifting on behalf of the rights of the least of these who are in the same situation as the lacrosse players as they did in this case. An extraordinary outpouring of public spirited lawyering on behalf of those victims. I would love to see it on behalf of the many others barely noticed except for the moment in which their guilt is proclaimed. One more aside, it has been a consistent problem for the media since it went respectable 60 or so years ago that its leaders are as loath to criticize each other, and I've said that as bar associations. Now, however, comes the internet and the blogosphere and the brave new world of the boys who are in their own way the shirt full of tight proliferation of media outlets. And there, it is a badge of honor to indict, <clears throat> to excoriate, to demagogue the performance of the press and each other. It drives a lot of us crazy in the business. I think it's wonderful. I think it is wonderful that there really are people now saying, no, no, we're not wizards. We're not even always very good men. And that we should be calling each other to account. Now, of course, half the blogosphere is irresponsible trash. And that is a price that you pay for that kind of competition and freedom. But what you get from it, which matters, you get, finally, a calling to account by those who know best when they see true egregious error being brought down. But let me uh, return to the immediate topic and get out. The concluding coda comes from the Supreme Court decision on Shepard. We must remember that reversals are but palliatives. The cure lies in those procedural methods that will prevent the prejudice at its source. The procedural methods that will prevent this at its source. Years ago, my dad wrote an editorial which suggested that uh, Bilbo 
uh, should become a verb. Bilbo was a horrible racist demagogue from Mississippi whose uh, normal way of discourse was to demagogue uh, whatever. And Dad wrote a new entry in the uh, dictionary to Bilbo to vilify, to assault on racial and ethnic grounds, da 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 da. And so to Nifong, a verb, to Nifong, to violate every canon, every principle, every single standard emblazoned in law school text and in bar association bylaws. He's the poster boy for all that is wrong. But as the dean has helped us understand, what was done to him should be the poster for future action to deal with the problem that you will be wrestling with for these next two days. Thank you very much.